uh, yeah, as uh, Zarina mentioned, I am formerly incarcerated. I'll, uh, I guess I'll preface my talk with just a, a little history. Um, I struggled with addiction when I was a young man, and, uh, and I resorted to armed robbery to support my habit. And I spent 23 years in California State Prison as a result of that. And uh, I was sentenced to life, and for many years, I, I did not think I was getting out. Um, so I can't describe what an incredible uh, honor and privilege, privilege it is to be speaking to you all here today. Um, and for many years, I just struggled with a sense of hopelessness. My prospects for getting out were very slim, and, uh, and I just sort of got swept away by the system. Um, about 10 years ago, I got into recovery, uh, I got into education, and things started to change. I started to see a little light at, at the end of the tunnel. And, um, and more than that, I started noticing what was going on around me. Uh, prior to that time, I was pretty self-absorbed, and I didn't really think about anyone other than myself. And when I opened my eyes, um, I didn't like what I saw. And, uh, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is a little bit about um, what the state of the system that I resided in for 23 years is, uh, how we got there, and, um, and some potential solutions. So what I'd like to do is sort of put, put mass incarceration in a historical context, um, and then offer some of the solutions that have occurred to me, and then hopefully foster a discussion, because the truth is I don't have um, the answer. I have some ideas, but I believe that uh, what we're experiencing in the United States is a, is a, a humanitarian crisis. Um, and I think it is so, the scope of it is so staggering uh, that there's really no easy out. Uh, I've been thinking long and hard about a solution, and I don't think there is one. I think uh, the only thing that we can do is maybe collectively come up with some uh, approaches and, uh, and, and be adaptable because uh, the criminal justice system is adapting as we speak. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So with that, I would like to uh, go to the next slide and just push play. I hope we have sound. Is it going to be quiet? Uh oh. Well, we'll make do. There you go. Okay. So I 
if you could go to the next slide. Uh, thank you. I chose to start with, with this because uh, the, the turning point in the criminal justice conversation I think began, um, or a beginning, uh, was when Michelle, Michelle Alexander wrote The New Jim Crow and it's, it began opening people's eyes to the, to the magnitude of the problem and the racial disparities. And uh, it was shortly after I read that book and started looking around that I noticed that uh, the prisons that I had been incarcerated in didn't really reflect society, uh, the society out here that I had left. Uh, there were many more people of color. Uh, I was a minority, whereas out here, I'm typically in the majority in most of the communities I lived in. And I began wondering why that was. Uh, it, it struck me as incongruous, to say the least. So I started reading more and, uh, and taking a look at some of the numbers. And I'm going to point out some of the numbers here. Uh, they're staggering. If you look at the United States as a whole, per 100,000 people, there are 730 incarcerated. We lead the world. Uh, the next closest country is Russia, who incarcerates roughly a half a percentage point. Um, and you'll, you'll look at the, the, the countries that top this list are typically oppressive regimes. Um, but what really stands out is if you look at the number uh, for black males. Nearly 5% of black males are incarcerated in this country. It's a stunning figure. Hispanic males is close to 2%, and white males, 7%. And when these figures started being publicized, uh, I think people took notice. This was about 10 years ago. And I took notice. And things started to change. Uh, I think it was a good starting point, but the problem is that the system is shifting. There's 2.2 million people incarcerated in this country. That means there's 2.2 million prison beds and they are resistant to being closed down. So as communities, uh, prosecution offices, um, jurisdictions start addressing these racial disparities, someone else ends up going to prison. Uh, prison population has not dropped in the last 10 years significantly. The racial disparities have decreased slightly. But the problem is that that reduction isn't coming be through a reduction of minority population. What's happening is more whites are being incarcerated. So to balance it out, what we see is criminalization of more and more human behaviors, um, longer sentences, more people going in the system. So there's been some relief in recent years. Youthful offenders have uh, been given some breaks. Uh, I have a friend who was serving life who was 17 when he went to a prison. He got in a fist fight. And uh, sadly, his adversary suffered an aneurysm and died. And he was sent to prison for life for murder. Because he was 17 at the time of his commitment offense, he was given some relief. That was new law, but every time a new law like that is passed, there's typically a trailer on there. Penalties for sex offenses are typically increased. Penalties for all kinds of different behaviors are raised. So when somebody gets some relief, it typically comes at the expense of someone else. So what I've noticed is the system is changing. So the more stuff like this is publicized, I, I, my concern is that if we tackle the problem of mass incarceration focused solely on racial disparity, racial disparity will shrink, but prison populations likely won't shrink. So that's one thing that I'm noticing happening in the last 10 years that uh, is cause for alarm, in my opinion. Um, for me, I think the goal has to be decarceration, period. I think racial disparities do need to be addressed. It's a tricky thing. If we can go to the next slide. It's a tricky thing because there's 51 themes in this story. There's 51 
There's 50 states and a federal system. And that's what makes the problem incredibly complex to address. Each state has their own criminal justice system, their own set of laws. The federal system has their own set of laws. And so there's no single fix and racial disparity varies from state to state. Uh, so the numbers continue to climb and as one state addresses these issues, others ramp it up. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about how we got here, how we got to 2.2 million people in, in prison in, in America. The civil rights era caused concern on both sides of the aisle. Uh, the Republicans, they, they saw it as an opportunity to exercise the Southern strategy. Uh, basically, uh, what, what that means is um, conservatives sought to woo uh, disaffected whites in the South, win their vote, and so they started uh, with the law and order chant. And that was really a, basically a dog whistle uh, to Southern racists who were unhappy with the turn of events, unhappy with the Civil Rights Act, wanted to maintain that status quo, but in uh, the, the rising era of political correctness, it was impossible to voice that. And so they reached out to this demographic successfully and had, and, and had a conservative ascend ascendance. If you think about Richard Nixon's administration all the way through the end of uh, Bush 1, in that period of time, the only, the only uh, relief was Carter for a brief four years and Ford for, for two there at the end of uh, Nixon's resignation. So it was incredibly successful, but unfortunately, uh, the Democrats basically jumped on the bandwagon. They tried to one-up uh, the conservatives, and you'll notice in that video we saw, uh, you notice Hillary Clinton uh, talking about this class of super predators and uh, Bill Clinton talking about three strikes, you're out. These folks conceivably did more to advance mass incarceration than any Republican ever did. And what, what we ended up with for a period of about 30 years was political one-upmanship. Who can be tougher on crime? Because it became, in effect, political suicide to be perceived as soft on crime. So we saw an increase in length of sentences, and more significantly, the, the single biggest contributing factor to mass incarceration initially was simply prosecutors across the nation choosing to, pro to file felony charges when they wouldn't have in the past. So there was a, a perceivable spike in crime from 1960 to 1990, which is when mass incarceration really took off. After that point, it basically leveled out and the, the numbers continued to swell. So there wasn't more crime, there were just more felony filings. So that's the initial story that got us here. Increased felony filings, sentences didn't increase significantly. During, during the 20 years after 1990, basically sentences sort of uh, flatlined. The average sentence served by a prisoner anywhere in America was about somewhere between three and five years, which was typical before that. It was just more people going to prison. But there's, again, that's the standard story. There's subplots. Each state is a little bit different, and I'm going to focus on California in particular because that's the system that I'm most familiar with. And I got to start somewhere. So California, the story is a little bit different. It's, it's a bit of an outlier in sentence length. In 1976, California had what was called an indeterminate sentence law. So everyone that was committed to a state prison in California went for a period to life, one year to life, five years to life, seven years to life. It didn't matter what the crime was. The potential was you would potentially die in prison if you didn't behave yourself. The result of that was incredible uh, disparity in time served. And typically, it impacted minorities negatively. So, a white person that went to prison for one to life for a burglary might spend one or two years, and a person of color might spend five or ten years. And so I think uh, 
there was a desire to remedy that. And so in 1976, California passed the Determinate Sentencing Law, which basically eliminated indeterminate sentences for the majority of crimes in California and came up with a scheme that just basically said if you do a burglary, you're going to do two years. It doesn't matter, black, white, brown, it's going to be two years. And it looked really good on paper. But they kept indeterminate sentencing for specific crimes. Uh, Homicide-related offenses, some robberies, um, and then notably the three strikes law which came some years after that. Uh, and there's a few more than, than that, but there were, some, there were some laws still on the books where you could get a term to life sentence and the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, crime categories, it was, it was going to be a, a, a determined number of years, and then you go home. The, the effect of that was California recidivism in 1977 was 15%, and today it's close to 70%. 70% of, of individuals released from state prison in California return within three years. Um, a big... There, there's been studies done that suggest that the motivation uh, of having to work to get out may have um, impacted individuals' desire to change while inside. And there, there may be some merit to that argument, but I want to talk about uh, some of the other things that I've experienced that I think uh, impact that. Yes? Yes. So in California, uh, it's an outlier in the country. Sentences typically haven't increased much, but California is a bit of an exception. Um, typically, more time is served in the state, and, and, I'm, and I'm coming to that right now on the next slide. So what's going on today? Um, so... The California prison system, such as it is, is exceedingly dysfunctional and unhealthy. It's a, it's a rare individual that isn't negatively impacted by it. And I'll share a, a, a story uh, from my own experience to kind of highlight that. Um, what I observed in my time inside is that uh, there are very many prisoners and very few guards. And it's, it's a management issue. Uh, sometimes the guards are in danger. Um, there have been assaults. There have been uh, killings of guards. In fact, uh, in the early 1970s, it was not uncommon for prison, prison guards to be murdered. And in one day in San Quentin, I think, how many was it? George Jackson? It was a few. Uh, this gentleman, George Jackson um, and Hugo Pinnell, uh, were part of a group um, that was tired of the inequities in the state prison. Um, they were involved with uh, the Black Guerrilla family, which was the uh, most influential black prison gang in the 1970s. It was uh, loosely affiliated with the Black Panthers. And uh, at that time, uh, Many black inmates were being killed by staff, shot over petty things like fist fights, and they got tired of it. And so they implemented a, a policy, basically, if you kill one of ours, we're going to kill one of yours. And, uh, and that happened. Um, and George Jackson ultimately was executed by guards at San Quentin Prison, um, and Hugo Pinnell was sent to Pelican Bay Shoe, where he spent 40 years. What's interesting is that Hugo and George also killed a couple of white inmates uh, during that period, uh, members of the Aryan Brotherhood, which is an influential white prison gang. And one of the things that George pointed to was the way that prison staff manipulated prisoners uh, against one another. Um, and when I read his memoir, I was still inside and I was still 
involved in uh, prison politics, and it and it made me it made me take a look at that. Uh, what he asserted was that uh, that the prison administration was inherently racist, and that it used white inmates to basically do its bidding, and uh, that didn't sit well with me. And I and I and I had to take a hard look at it. It made me very uncomfortable. And when I started looking at uh, the behaviors that I'd exhibited and the, the favors that I'd accepted from staff, I realized that it fit my experience. Um, I often would receive warnings from uh, prison guards, white prison guards, uh, who would express their racist sentiments to me. One in particular bragged about a black inmate that he had killed on the prison yard because the, the person had the gall to put his hands on him and gave him an excuse to do so. And, uh, and he would warn me if, um, if there was information and the, the institutional security squad was going to come and search my cell. Uh, and I realized that I don't think it was witting on his part, uh, but I was being manipulated. He would also suggest that I was good, a good convict, because I would uphold this convict code. And this convict code basically says, thou shalt not uh, talk about the things that go on inside. You shall not snitch. Um, if you are convicted of a certain crime, you should be persecuted. If you're a sex offender, you should be targeted. Um, there's, what I experienced from these sympathetic staff was rampant misogyny, rampant racism, and rampant, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, disgust for people convicted of sex offenses. And what, what ended up happening was the population was pitted against one another on racial lines, on um, offense lines, what somebody was incarcerated for. And the favors that I received were contingent upon me upholding this code. So I was, I was in fact being manipulated by this system. And what really convinced me that this was ongoing and pervasive in the system, because I was only at, ever at one prison at one time with a very limited view, was in 2016, a year before I got out, I was working uh, as, a, as a counselor in an institutional treatment program, and there was a, uh, a guard assigned to security in this um, treatment facility. And I worked there for four years, and I became very close with him. He was another white guard. Uh, with very similar attitudes, and it was very comfortable for me. I slipped into it uh, very easily. Um, and I, I'd say developed a, a friendship with him. And he did me favors. He allowed me to look at my confidential file as I was preparing for board, preparing for release. There was information gathered about me throughout the years that would impact me negatively that I would have to address. And so I, I felt beholden to this guy. And in 2016, he called me into, into his office and sat me in front of his institutional computer and showed me the report of the murder of Hugo Pinnell. And he was beaming. Forty years later, he told me, we finally got that son of a bitch. We finally got the guy that took some of us out. And how did he do it? Him and his ilk. Hugo was 71, was released after 41 years of isolation, and sent to Folsom State Prison, one of the highest security prisons in the state, on a prison yard that reflected most other prison yards with a majority of black and Hispanic inmates and a few whites. And somehow this poor gentleman found himself isolated in a narrow alley near where the, the laundry and the canteen is, with the few whites that happened to be on that yard. And they stabbed him to death. I've done enough time to know that that doesn't just happen without the orchestration of staff. And the hell of it is that the gentlemen that committed that murder were also affiliated with the Aryan Brotherhood, who also lost some members back in 1970, so they had an axe to grind, and they had a long memory, just like the correctional officers. 
And here's the really cruel twist. Those gentlemen and some others that had coordinated the attack are now being prosecuted for more crimes. And guess who's testifying against them? The very staff that orchestrated this murder, in my opinion. Be difficult to prove. Uh, and that's one of the difficulties about uh, this convict code and, the, and the, the system. It's shrouded in secrecy. Nobody would ever know this unless they'd been in it. And even, even the information that I have, it's piecemeal. I get it from anecdotal evidence and from stories and, and, the, and, and just the coincidence that I happen uh, to be in a position to, to get this information from this, this officer a year before I got out. So, that culture, in my opinion, is what breeds that 70% recidivism. When I think about somebody that's been exposed to that for 5, 10, 20 years, and then is asked to come out in the 21st century and catch up on technology and feel good about themselves and uh, compete in the job market, and these are the kind of tools that they've been equipped with, uh, to me it's not a surprise that those are what the numbers are. And things are changing. As I touched on before, uh, the racial disparities, the racial makeup, blacks are becoming a smaller percentage of incarcerated people, but the beds, aren't, the beds are not emptying out. So what we see now is a rise, the outliers. 26% uh, of federal prisoners and nearly 20% of California prisoners are now foreign born. Uh, the line between immigration enforcement and law enforcement is becoming blurred. And the number and categories for sex offenses are rising. More and more people are becoming incarcerated for longer. In fact, I came across uh, an interesting, a sad case uh, when I was researching this talk. There was an individual in Arizona, I believe, who received a 200-year sentence for 10 uh, child pornography images on his computer. And that is probably one of the longer ones, but if it's 50 years or 200 years, you get the picture. And as I said, for the first 30 years there, the length of sentences didn't really drive mass incarceration, but that too is now beginning to change. Uh, the increase in the use of life sentences after the abolition and reinstitution of the death penalty has led to more than 200,000 individuals in this country with life sentences or virtual life sentences. And by virtual life, I mean if somebody gets sentenced, sentenced to 200 years, it may not be an indeterminate sentence, um, but the likelihood of them living out that sentence is non-existent. So they're not categorized as lifers, but they're going to die in prison. So the numbers, are, the numbers are staggering and they're growing. And how that evolved, there didn't used to be a, a, a big use of life sentences or life without in this country, but when they abolished the death penalty, they looked for an alternative. So there was a period of time of about five or six years in the early, yes? Yes, yeah, so typically with a sentence like that, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, um, they would do 85% of that. So they could earn 15% off for good behavior. Some, depending on the sentence and depending on where they are, they could potentially earn more. Um, the best case scenario I've ever heard of is earning, getting two-thirds off and doing one-third. But that's typically, uh, the individuals that get that kind of break, serve at fire camps, and they have to be doing five years or less. The death penalty was abolished? It was. Uh, it was from uh, I, somewhere in the late 60s to the, to the early 1970s. Uh, you guys may remember the Charles Manson case. So he was sentenced to death, and I believe that was in 69. Um, and then his sentence was commuted to life in early 1970, and I'm fuzzy on the dates, because federally it was abolished for a brief period and then it was reinstituted. Right. So it was gone for a minute, and then it came back. But that minute was really significant because what happened was, in lieu of the death penalty, the, the new sentence of life without parole was created. But when the death penalty came back, that sentence didn't go away. And so what, what I believe is happening today is that the death penalty is serving as an anchor 
for all the more punitive measures in, in all the jurisdictions in the country. So now, if somebody has uh, life without, that's typically a default for a case that would have merited the death penalty. Uh, but now it's used for broad categories of cases. There's almost 5,000 people in California alone who are sentenced to life without, which means there's no conceivable way without a governor pardoning them that they could ever get out. They don't ever see a board. They don't get good time. Nothing. Uh, and then, so that's apparently more desirable than the death penalty, the life without. And then below the life without, you've got the life with. And you've got sentences like 7 to life, 15 to life, 25 to life, which are looked at. I, I took a deal for 27 to life because I was facing 140 something years. That seemed like a good proposition to me. And more and more with the, uh, with the ability to threaten individuals who find themselves ensnared in the system with these ex extraordinary amount of years, it becomes very, very easy to get somebody to plead out to a, a 10 or a 15 or a 20 year deal. People don't even bat their eye. It, it seems not that uh, extraordinary anymore. I think what's happened is as a society we become immune to it. If somebody gets 10 or 15 years, it seems like, oh, well, that's, for many people, that's not that bad. Uh, could I go to the next one? Thank you. So I mentioned that California is an outlier in uh, life sentences and life without. Uh, if you look at the numbers here, there's 40,691 inmates in California who are sentenced to life with the possibility or life without, which is 31.3% of the prison population in this state. And that's significant because that number doesn't shrink. I, I am standing here and I'm blessed to have several other former lifers in the room with me, but it's still a drop in the bucket. And it's only been in the last eight or nine years that any of us been, have been released. Uh, because it, for many, many years it didn't matter if you had seven to life, 15 to life, 25 to life. The deal was you had to convince a, a prison board of commissioners to let you out, and that just didn't happen. Uh, it, was, it wasn't um, politically expedient, and so nobody ever got out. The first 10 years that I was inside, I never saw a single life term prisoner ever parole. And now, uh, some of us are paroling, but it's still a drop in the bucket. Uh, I think about 3,000 to date have been released, but more are coming in than are coming out. So this number is going to continue to grow, and that percentage point is going to continue to grow. And we're the biggest in the nation. Utah is rivaling us, but as you see, they, they, it's a very small state with 2,000 lifers. And again, our population continues to grow. Um, so that is another uh, point I wanted to make. That sense of despair and hopelessness amongst this population is palpable. Many lose hope. Um, I've got two, my two best friends are still inside. Uh, we were 24 when we went to prison, and we're approaching 50 now, and their prospects of ever getting out are nil. Uh, because for many, many years, we didn't ever see anybody get out, and they just um, didn't change. Uh, continued to stay stuck in the system, continued to buy into the, to the racial rhetoric, and, and, uh, and so what they've ultimately done is they've accumulated prison write-ups, and uh, subsequent cases and, and more sentences. And so the reality for them is uh, they're, they're likely never going to get out. And that, that's two out of three from my little crew. So I don't know, I don't know what that looks like on a system-wide level, but I know that uh, there's 40,000 lifers and maybe 3,000 3, of us out here on the streets today. My hope is that that changes and the trend continues. But I know for many, uh, the hope is gone because they screwed up so bad initially when there was no hope that they've, dig in, they've dug themselves a hole that they can probably not get out of. Can I go to the next slide? So, um, so now I want to uh, talk a little bit about solutions. Um, that, that's the problem. That's what it is on a nationwide level and in the state of California. Uh, there's a lot of factors that have played into it and there's a lot of things that are contributing to it to this day. And this video I came across, and it, and it really underscores for me, I think, the central uh, thrust of the problem. Yes. It'd be great. 
Yes. Yes. Thank you. I wanted to touch on that. Um, and so I, I talked about the ways that the, that the population is sort of pitted against one another. And I'd say that it's most, it's, it's dramatic uh, for foreign nationals. One of the reasons why is that they're not eligible. What few rehabilitative programs there are on the inside, uh, the treatment program that I was fortunate enough to work in for the last four years that I was inside excluded anyone that was not a U.S. citizen. Um, sometimes they're excluded from things like GED programs. Uh, and the rationale is this, that they're going to be deported when they're released anyway. And as a nation, we're not going to invest in these human beings that we're going to ship out of here anyway. It's, it's, it's one of the most inhumane uh, aspects of the system, in my opinion. Uh, and as a group, um, they feel incredibly marginalized. Uh, they feel like they're not part of, and whatever issues may have brought them there, everyone in these systems are human beings. They, and, and you know what, make no mistake, uh, typically have, have um, exhibited some very bad behaviors. That's driven by something. Um, what I discovered while inside was that it was, prison is a collecting pool for some of the most harmed, uh, trauma-impacted individuals in society. I can't tell you how many individuals, when I was working as a counselor, confided in me that they'd been sexually abused, uh, how many had been physically abused, um, how many had been turned out by their mom when they were 12 and started shooting dope with her. Um, and to be in a system like that and have all that and then to be further marginalized and say, you know what, you're not good enough to participate in this program. You're not one of us. Uh, and sadly, the population inside picks up on that. And so there is, it's so segregated. Foreign-born inmates stick with foreign-born inmates. And if they're from Mexico, they stick with Mexico. If they're from Asia, they stick with Asia, at least in my experience, on the male side of the house. I, I'm not sure what it looks like on the female side of the house. On racial lines on offense lines. It, it, I can't imagine a way that it could be more segregated or more dysfunctional. Does that answer your question? So I'd like to, I'd like to play this and this, I think, for me, really informs the, the, the scope of the problem. Okay. So this, this gentleman is facing 100 years in prison. Uh, this is a current event. This is ongoing in Florida today. Um, and his crime, he was a security guard, an armed security guard at a school where there was a mass shooting. And he panicked. The prosecutor said, for the life of me, I cannot explain how this gentleman could do this behavior. Can't explain how a human being could freeze in the face of fear. And that's what he did. 
he froze. There was a mass shooter that was killing many, many children, and this gentleman was scared to death, and he hid behind a pillar. Now, I could agree that he probably shouldn't be a school security guard anymore. <laughs> but a uh, hundred years in prison, to me, this really underscores where we're at as a society. Human behavior is being put on trial. Fear. The man panicked. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I expect that maybe a fight or flight response or something like that was kicking in, and this guy was probably petrified and maybe couldn't move. I don't know. But what I sense is that that pain was so great for the mothers that lost their children that they want to exact some revenge. Um, and, and I think that that is what we're up against, that, that society has become increasingly punitive, and we're looking just to, many are looking to just take it out on someone, take that pain out, maybe make somebody else feel what they're feeling. I don't really know, I don't, I don't have that um, going on, so it's difficult for me to wrap my mind around, but I definitely see it. So, that's, in my opinion, the problem. Uh, incredibly punitive society, uh, many dynamics and factors at play that are driving these numbers up, and no end in sight. There's political will in this country today to roll some of this stuff back. Uh, youthful offenders have been getting a break of late. Um, some uh, violent offenders, depending on, you know, if it's not sex related or uh, something along those lines, sometimes can get some relief. But it typically comes at the expense of somebody else. An old guard who panicked. Somebody's going to fill that bed. May not be a robber anymore, may not be a burglar. Yes? I, I'm, I'm certain, certainly that argument can be made, and I, I won't say this guy should be a, he was very poor at his job, uh, undoubtedly. Uh, it just struck me that, that, that for some folks it seems like a rational response to send him to prison for the rest of his life for panicking. I mean, he's not going to live out a hundred year sentence. Um, you know, so that, that's what struck me. Not that he's heroic or anything like that, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty lamentable, for sure. Uh, what struck me was that desire to give this gentleman a hundred years and, and this, this bafflement. Like, how could somebody do this? I can understand it. It saddens me, but I get it. The guy panicked. I've seen that. You know, I've been in, involved in riots, on, it, you know, and I've seen people panic. It's scary. So, uh, I don't hate the man. You know, I don't, I don't want to see him pine away in prison. I definitely don't want to see him working as a school guard anymore. Yeah. So, so I want to I want to get into a, a little uh, um, about directions to go from here, and and then maybe take some questions and then hopefully have a conversation. Because like I said, I don't really have a lot of answers. I've got some ideas and some hopes, and one of them is um, the death penalty. Uh, like I said, I I believe that that serves as an anchor for all the other punitive sanctions in our in our criminal justice system. And many, many nations have abolished it. Um, in particular, in America, I just wanted to, I'm, I'm a big numbers guy, and I want to I point out that uh, there's a, a, an organization called Witness to Innocence um, that advocates for the abolition of the death penalty throughout the United States. And this is the story that they tell. For every nine executions, one death row inmate has been exonerated. Since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976, there's a statistic, or the, the number I was looking for, 165 men and women from 28 states have been exonerated and free from death row. And on average, an exonerated death row survivor spends 11.5 years 
behind bars for crimes they didn't commit. Okay, so remember that number, 165. Can I go to the next slide? So since the death penalty was reinstituted in uh, 76, there have been 1,500 executions, roughly, uh, in, in the United States. So I'm not a math major, but I think that that is higher than 10%. 165 have been freed, and 1,500 have been executed. So that doesn't seem like a very good um, success rate. Um, to my way of thinking, if one innocent person uh, were put to death for these 1,500 people, it wouldn't be worth it. I mean, if, if you asked me, would it be worth it for my son, if he were innocent of a crime, to be executed if it meant 1,499 Jeffrey Dahmers were executed? I'd say no. Leave my son alone. But it's 10%. And the reason why I want to point this out is that I think California was very, very close to eliminating the death penalty in the last cycle. Uh, the margin was, was very slight, and I went and I researched some of the ads that were being run, and it looked like they were predominantly run on finance. Uh, the arguments that they were making was that the death penalty is not um, cost effective. Yes? I think the government has declared a moratorium as of now. That's right. We're, that's the next slide. Um, so that was in 2016. They didn't, they didn't uh, eliminate the death penalty. In fact, the state voted to ramp it up, to speed it up, and to eliminate some of the appeals. But it was very, very close. And I suspect that maybe if, if some of this type of information would have been used versus the, the cost-effectiveness argument, the result might have been different. But the reason I'm pointing this out is I think that, that it's achievable. It, it seems like we're close enough in this state to potentially getting rid of it. And I think that that is critical to really addressing mass incarceration. As long as this sanction is on the board, I think it's going to be difficult to, to deal with all the other stuff. So if I could go to the next slide. You are right. Uh, push play. There are innocent people on death row. There are guilty people on death row. And those people are not would be let out by this act, we would be held to account. But we don't want to join Saudi Arabia. We don't want to perpetuate what's happening in North Korea. We don't want to be part of what's happening in Iran and Iraq and China, Somalia, Pakistan, and Egypt. By the way, those were the countries, those last five, that joined the United States of America in executing more of their citizens than any other nations on planet Earth. Three out of four nations in the world know better and are doing better. They've abolished the death penalty. It's time California joined those ranks. The question really is, do we have the right to kill? Do we have the right to kill? And that's a, a deep and existential question. I, I don't believe we do. You know? I know there's this thing, people think it's eye for eye, but if you rape, we don't rape. I think if someone kills, we don't kill. We're better than that. So this moratorium advances that principle. We will reprieve those on death row and not commuting the sentences. People still remain in custody. I have enormous respect and admiration for people that disagree. I'm not going to judge folks that I strongly have views on this. Uh, and for those victims, all I can say is uh, that I, as a father of four, I can't even conceive of their pain, can't even conceive of their suffering, can't even conceive of how they process the entire system of justice, let alone the issues related to the death penalty, and how every time these issues come up, once again, it opens up those wounds. And so my heart goes out to each and every one of them and having heard from victims that feel very strong on all sides of this issue, um, I can only express uh, that uh, people have Thank deeply you. held beliefs that are very personal and I must respect those. So Governor Newsom, I think it was an incredibly courageous act uh, to grant this reprieve, this moratorium on the death penalty. There's 700 people approximately at San Quentin on death row and uh, a number of women 
uh, as well or housed elsewhere. And um, that's the biggest number in the country, um, the, biggest, the biggest death row. But part of that is California traditionally hasn't executed a lot of people. I think since the, the death penalty was reinstated, the number is somewhere around 12 or 15. And I think that speaks to um, our will as a state. It's not really there. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, it baffles me uh, that we still have it in this state. One of the most progressive in the union, and here we still sit with it. Um, so this was incredibly courageous, but that reprieve leaves with Newsom. Um, so the laws are still on the books. Uh, there's still individuals on death row. And until the law is off the books, um, the threat looms. And again, all of those collateral possibilities continue to exist and the anchor that it serves for all these other punitive measures. So it's difficult to talk about doing away with life without or rolling back some of the term to life sentences while there's still a death penalty because many of these individuals are look, looked at as though, okay, well, you know, you got a break. You didn't get the death penalty or you didn't get life without and so on and so forth. So for me, I think that this is a, this is a significant starting place. Um, so I wanted to leave on a high note and look at some of the wonderful things that are happening uh, today to address mass incarceration in general. Um, there's three central causes of prison growth, uh, according to John Pfaff. Unregulated prosecu prosecutorial power, I don't want to get uh, too into this stuff. Structural political failures and the punishment of convicted uh, of people convicted of violent crimes. And that's the big driver for mass incarceration is violent crime. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to point to that, that, that one video of the guy uh, freezing up. Um, I, think, I think, sadly, tragically, violence is part and parcel to the human experience, especially among young men. Uh, it, it's a thing. I don't think it's going anywhere. And we haven't been successful in caging it away. Um, prisons do a good job of incapacitating. So if somebody harm someone else and they're locked away for life, that, that individual will not harm someone else, at least not in society. Uh, but violent crime hasn't disappeared. Uh, it, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed as a society, uh, but I, I'll argue that prison isn't always the way to do it. Oftentimes is not the way to do it. I think there's other alternatives. Um, so I'm going to look at uh, some of the things that I found really inspirational of late. Okay. Um, so, abolition of death penalty, I think, is significant. Um, and then we talked about the, the structural political uh, problems with rolling back mass incarceration. I think uh, the second most important thing is restoring uh, the rights to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals in this country. There's almost 10 million of us. That's a huge voting block. Um, and, and I think it serves a couple of important purposes. For, for folks that have felt marginalized and felt not part of and felt disassociated from society, I think if you re-enfranchise them or maybe even like Maine and Vermont do, allow them to vote while they're incarcerated, you maybe encourage them to feel part of. You maybe uh, send the message that you're not irredeemable, that your voice should be heard, and, um, and that you'll reintegrate and be part of once again someday. So this organization, uh, All of Us or None, is doing some great work here in the state of California. They're out of the East Bay, and they advocate for uh, the re-enfranchisement of the 46,000 people on parole in California, and uh, many, many more nationally. Um, so California is uh, relatively liberal in this regard. When one gets off a of parole, you get to vote again. Some states, if you've ever been convicted of a felony, you are forever disenfranchised. Um, so it's a significant uh, voting block, and I think there's many, many benefits to rolling this back, empowering people that have, that have dealt with the system. And then the other thing is this. Without that voice, the system continues to change. Um, Folks like me, I don't know where to turn. Donald Trump just signed a bill that is actually very beneficial to incarcerated folks. And that, you know, I hate to acknowledge anything that that gentleman has done. Whereas Hillary and Bill uh, did some very, very harmful things to mass incarceration. So, like, there, there's really no 
safe quarter to turn to. But I think if that segment of the population had a vote and had a voice and was recognized, then maybe, maybe someone would emerge who would maybe acknowledge that this segment of the population counts and is worthwhile and maybe will hear some of their issues and address some of those rather than just ignoring them because there's no voting power there. Um, so I love these guys and there's a bunch of material over here if anyone is interested. And then this one, uh, I'll just, I'll let it speak for itself. My name is Skyler, and uh, I'm a junior at Calvin College. I'm doing a business marketing major and political science minor. Forgive Everyone is a clothing brand that's attempting to raise awareness for the whole humanity and experience of people who have been formerly incarcerated, as well as raising funds for nonprofits that are working on the ground to help resolve some of the barriers they're facing in society. One of the ways we're doing that primarily is uh, through the clothing brand, so trying to reach the general population who generally wouldn't really care about these issues and haven't really heard about them, uh, get them interested in the clothing, get them to stay for the stories, so uh, sharing multiple stories of people who have been incarcerated and sharing their full experience uh, through the website. There's definitely conflict when you meet with someone who's done something that outside of the realm of your imagination could have done. Um, and what really helps me when that initial shock factor hits is it's really important to separate the crime from the person. You're forgiving the person, you're not forgiving the action. You're saying the person is deserving of love, not the action that they did. No, in a lot of ways, my confidence, and um, to, to be more optimistic. But him just being a friend, um, being in touch with me here and there, checked up on me. <laughs> and that's important for me right now. I mean, I don't, I don't know about a lot of other people and everything who've got to deal with uh, some of the things in the life, but me being able to get out and socialize and talk, interact with has been a big help. The fact is, even if you think they don't deserve forgiveness or help, it's better for society in general to help people. Because they're more likely to commit offenses, to become violent, to, uh, to hurt society in some way when they are isolated and when there is no help. Especially after going out and meeting a lot of people who've been in prison and becoming friends with them, establishing relationships with them. I, I can't walk away. There's guys I now I meet up with every week, Friday for coffee. There's guys I go down to the bitter end and play chess with. Um, I stay in constant communication, writing people in prison. I can't imagine how different my life would look if that all just dropped off. You know, if I just stopped doing this. So uh, I was struck by that when I saw it. I, I experienced something very similar. Um, when <laughs> you're next, buddy. <laughs> when uh, when I was released uh, about a year and a half ago, I felt like everybody could see right through me. I identified with um, the worst decisions I'd ever made in my life, and I thought that everybody uh, could see that and was judging me. Um, and uh, I was embraced. Uh, by so many loving individuals in this community, and it really served to uh, help me reclaim my humanity and, and connect and feel part of. And, um, and so when I saw that, I realized it reminded me of so many of the, the friends that I would love in this city. Um, and, it, and it gave me hope because I thought, well, maybe it's just because it's San Francisco. I chose, I'm from Los Angeles, and I chose to come to San Francisco because I thought, you know, th this might be a community where somebody like me might uh, realize some acceptance and, and have a chance and uh, and it's proven to be true but I thought well I'm living in the bubble and I saw this and I realized well maybe it's not just the bubble maybe there's 
kind and loving souls throughout this nation who are willing to uh, embrace individuals who have made some bad decisions and, uh, and befriend them and love them. Um, and, uh, and so I'm going to close on this video, which uh, actually pictures many of those people that I'm talking about, uh, and then we'll just open it up for questions. I went to prison for a second year murder that I committed when I was 17. So you served 20 years. And now you're playing Dungeons and Dragons in a manicure in San Francisco with guys from tech, lawyers, neuroscience. Yeah. Like when I first was incarcerated, I was extremely introverted. I was so fear driven. When I was in prison, Dungeons and Dragons is something that just fell into my lap. For me, this is like a life simulator to practice my listening skills, pay attention to information, be intentional about what I want to do, have some kind of structure. All of these that I got, it, it, it facilitated through Dungeons and Dragons. By a show of hands, how many of you served time in prison? So, you're going to have to do it. My name is Sarah Rudolph. I am an attorney and founder of Crystal Entry Network. If you learned how to play D&D, Dungeons and Dragons, so you could connect with some of these guys coming out of prison. Yeah. Dungeons and Dragons is about collective role playing. And we all together are building a story as our characters. It's a big thing inside of all these prisons. What would you have to bring the group together? Some of the same fellows that we gained with, the front we're starting to be released. Mark now, Chris got out, Al got out. All these dudes started getting out like, hey, well, then let's start playing. It's a matter of community building, getting people to come around the table and relate in a way that they wouldn't usually relate and the people they might not usually relate with. And DD is really great way to do that. Anything that takes prison out of your head is the, the even though you're incarcerated, you're not there. Mm -hmm. It was definitely an escape. It's creativity, untapped, and and I get to try on different uh, ways of being. When I played the game, there was no necessary conformity to prison rules within this world. There is a benefit uh, socially, like the networking, it just blew me away. I'm fresh out of prison, and um, I had access to PhDs in physics, and people that started up multi-laid off companies. There's things that people are doing here that are making the world a better place, and it's centered around me and me. I am a product manager for a I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I did that. I work for a non profit that advances technologies that are beneficial for the future of humans. Very San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Makes you be out of the crimes. Yeah. I'm judged by what I do today in this environment. Especially at that table. Yes. We started with the giant, but it became a little bit. When I'm struggling with something, like, or it's amazing, I talk with you, like, forgiveness and my problems, and it just feels like a really mutual friendship. So often, uh, formerly incarcerated people just kick in on uh, formerly incarcerated people. But I don't really think that's true in the integration of society. I don't think that's the end that we should be striving for. Would you say you guys have a real friendship now? Mm -hmm. The game brought us together. We're similar characters. Mm. You kind of look a little similar, too. Yeah. I feel like kind of my life has gone by already, and it, and it went by so fast. And so, really, um, I had the opportunity to make an impact in the world, and that people will know who I am, they will know about the horrible circumstances of my past, but leaning on the community and finding new skills to move forward, I feel blessed. Uh, so if there's any questions, um, yes. Stock market, and I just think that there would be a to make 
archers, walls, and uh, war laws. This is built beds. This is stock. Sure. So. It, it, so that, that is one of the problems that's, that's emerging, and it, and it gets a lot of press. Um, there, there is private prisons. There's one in this city, um, down, a, down in the Tenderloin, believe it or not. It's a federal halfway house where uh, individuals serve out the remainder of their sentence, and it's run by a private corporation that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange chain. And uh, it, 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 honestly, it makes me sick. Um, but it's a... It, it's not an incredibly influential segment as yet. The lobbying efforts of the private prisons pale in comparison, especially when it comes to uh, the prison guard unions. California's done a particularly good job. They've got the most powerful guard union in the nation, and they pretty much excluded private prisons from the state system in this state. This state does house people in private prisons, but they send them to like Oklahoma, uh, Mississippi, and that number is shrinking. Um, so they're trying to maintain their control and their monopoly on prisons, but the federal government uses it and several other states use it. it, it it's, a, it's, a, it's a small fraction of the influence, but it's a growing one, and it's an alarming one. And uh, the white privilege, I'd like to touch on that. Uh, you know, I am uh, formerly incarcerated, uh, and uh, it just stunned me. Um, Samantha here is a, a colleague of mine, or was. We taught together, and uh, the school that we teach for our main office is at a police station, and to get upstairs to get bus tokens to, so we can go take field trips, you have to get by a, a police officer and go through a metal detector. And um, she has had a pristine life and is a graduate of Berkeley and happens to be brown and have a tattoo or, or two. <laughs> and, they, and they stop her, and they, and they say, what school do you go to, honey? And she's like, I teach for five keys. And they pick up the phone, and then they hang it up, and they go, what school did you say you go to, honey? And I walk in the door with my checkered past, looking like this, and I am immediately ushered upstairs. Right this way, sir. And it, it's just, it's stunning. Uh, it, it, really, it really drives home uh, to me um, that it does exist. Um, but it doesn't capture everybody's experiences. There's plenty of individuals who maybe haven't experienced that um, and have experienced uh, poverty and depredation and trauma and happen to be white. So it, it's not the whole story, but it definitely exists. Um, can you, you mentioned the statistic about recidivism rate in the 70s. I think it was 17% and then it grew to 71%. Um, I, I think those were the, the comparisons. Can you, you mentioned a few hypotheses, like the technology shift, so how it will compete, and, can you just go over those? Because that's such a dramatic shift in the recidivism rate. And it just, it just struck me. Like, what is the cause of that? So I'll, I'll just speak from personal experience. I've, I've, uh, I've enjoyed a relatively seamless reentry into society. Um, but I know many, many people who haven't, who, who do struggle to find housing. Somebody who's spent uh, 20 or 30 years incarcerated uh, maybe many of their family have uh, passed away, so they don't have much of a social support network. They, they typically aren't going to uh, develop a skill set in prison that's going to be competitive in today's job market. Um, and then I, I'd say one of the most overwhelming factors is, is, is that sense of not being part of and not connected and, and being isolated from, from the vast expanse of humanity. For most of the people I've known, that, that's one of the biggest challenges. Um, feeling like there's that scarlet letter and not really having, and then on top of that, um, this toxic masculinity, which is so pervasive inside of institutions, and this notion that to be a man, you have to be a provider and you have to be tough, and you come out and maybe you've got kids and maybe you've got a, a partner and you're feeling this pressure to provide instead of maybe taking resources, you want to give resources. And you're struggling to do that. And I've seen that uh, as a pitfall for many. When they struggle with that, and they revert to behaviors that they know are going to produce, and produce quickly, and ultimately uh, criminal behaviors, and ultimately lead them back behind bars. And, and I think in, in many instances, it's a setup for failure. And I think it disproportionately affects uh, communities with people of color. Uh, I, I come out and that privilege hasn't gone away. And my 
transition has been relatively seamless. And that's not what I see happening for a lot of folks. Um, so it makes me ask the question, what's going on here? Something's off. So I, I, I could speculate, um, but I, I think there's so many factors that play into that. Just, just to put, do you think that those factors like isolation and toxic masculinity were less acute in the 70s that explains the much lower recidivism rate back then? Well, uh, so I really hadn't thought about that, um, to be honest with you. Uh, it, I, I was stunned by that statistic when I saw it. Um, prison populations were much, much smaller, a fraction of what they in California are today. Uh, and then people had to work to get out. It was, that, it was that indeterminate sentence, one to life, five to life. So there is one segment of the, re, of the returning population whose numbers are staggering. The, re, the returning lifers, uh, the 3,000 or so that have been released, their, their um, return rate is like 3%. Um, so that, that probably did play a factor. Somebody had to work at it and had to prove themselves and convince somebody that they, that they were rehabilitated. Uh, must have played some factor. Oh okay. God, you, you, and then Yurina, yes. Yeah, I have some questions. So like, you, know, like you mentioned that like, you know, there is like, this drive to fill up the beds like, you know, in prison. So like, is there is like more beds than prisoners on, on average? There is like empty beds in the American prison. Uh, not that I've seen. Um, so what, what I have seen is that the conversation has shifted in the last 10 years. And uh, today there's an acknowledgement that in America, in the land of the free, with 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners, that there's something wrong with that picture and that that doesn't represent. Right, right, right. right. But, but like in your prison, like you was in prison. There was like bad, you know, like, so each prisoner got bad, like you know, how, how, how there is empty bad, so there is like not enough bad for prisoners. So, so what I saw in my time was two beds in a cell, okay. and they were always full. And as the population continued to increase, they started putting beds in the the living areas, like the day room. They started filling up the gyms. So. The beds just continued to expand and spend, and, and they crammed more people in until in California, uh, the, the Supreme Court actually ruled that they were treating people inhumanely and unconstitutionally. And the reason uh, California's number of incarcerated people has shrunk dramatically in the last uh, seven years because of a, a court ruling that forced uh, California to adjust its numbers. And what they did is they realigned and they, they, they diverted many people that would have previously gone to prison to county jails. So now that, it's, it's a shell game. Um, so, but, but California is leading the fight. I'd, I'd say California, with the exception of death row and, and life-term prisoners, is actually uh, enacting some significant reforms in, in, in recent years. Um, but if there's 2.2 million people in prison, that means there's 2.2 million beds. And so when somebody enacts a reform and gives some group relief, there's oftentimes a, a legislative trailer that's added on it that's going to increase the sanction on somebody else. That's the point I was trying to make. So somebody may get out, but somebody else is going to go fill that bed. The beds have been built, and, the, and the, there's this momentum to keep them filled. I also have a question about like, you know, the rich prisoners. So say, like, uh, you know, like, Somebody was like, you know, like a, I don't know, leader of the gang, right? Like you know, they go in, like, you know, and what do they like? You know, do they sleep on the same bed in the same cell, or like you know, they have like you know, better conditions? There is like way, like you know, maybe like you know, a more corrupt way to get a better conditions, like you know. uh -huh. yeah. do people do. It? I mean, uh, the prison system is pretty bleak, and uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can. You can manipulate yourself to maybe a more desirable cell location, but it's going to look identical to every other cell. So you, you mean like you know, somebody like you know, has like has like I don't know like a statewide gang like you know, running like outside of the prison, so they have money, right? Like you know, and they cannot make like they still like you know live in the same cell, like you know, have the same responsibilities, like guards bothering them the same way as like any other prison. 
Yes. Wow. Yes. It's shocking. Yes. Um, so, for example, the, 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 the figures of 17% recidivist is telling that prism is not efficient in terms of like rehabilitating people to kind of live in the society in the way society wants them to live in. Um, <coughs> being there, on, as you said, like being able to get back to normal like society life. Is there some low on the fruit that could make prison like better or kind of more efficient to uh, like is there things that we could we could do? That's right. yeah. that's the million dollar question and that's why I was hoping to foster a conversation because I haven't figured it out, but there's some other countries that are doing some pretty laudable things and definitely we could be doing a better job. Uh, Zarina. Um, yeah, so I guess um, with the sort of like model that it's, it's a, a prison industrial complex is a money making engine, and like you said, uh, if we reduce some sentences, it seems like other people get it and get it in their health. I think um, I think a really important place to, to work on this is preventing people from going to prison, right? And I think that's not something we can rely on the state for. I think that's not something we can rely on the police for. But I think that is something that we can do. Uh, and I think that's like a, an important place to focus. And my question then to you is, do you have a sense of like, uh, so the, I think the, the place that people really struggle with this is like uh, murder and sexual assault. These are sort of things that like people tend to suddenly think that you just should be punished for. Uh, do you have a sense of how we change that culturally? That, that's the million dollar question. I, I, I think um, that that is the task that we're faced with. Uh, and as crazy as this sounds, I think it involves um, not condoning that behavior, but, but normalizing it to a degree and not uh, um, demonizing it to the extent that we do. I'll be, I'll be frank with you. Uh, all of my best friends have killed people, as tragic as that is. And they're good people, each and every one of them that has made a tragic decision either to get behind the wheel of a car when drunk or to get in a fist fight uh, over a girl when they were 17 years old. God forbid. Um, and I guess that means that everyone that did that and somebody didn't die, they should be charged with attempted murder. I don't know. And some of them have been gang involved and, and have shot people. Um, and, and other people have uh, committed sexual assaults. And this is, it's, it's hard for me to say this, having come from this culture where that behavior was so demonized and I, and, and I participated in persecuting individuals that had uh, participated in those behaviors. But the truth is, um, they're human beings uh, who have made lamentable choices and, and I think are worthy of forgiveness and, and are really my allies. Um, they, they are faced with the same challenge as I am. Uh, Remodeling themselves uh, coming up with new behaviors and reintegrating into a society that considers them pariahs. And I really, really feel a lot of uh, empathy for, for individuals who, who have sexual offenses because there's so many collateral consequences to a criminal conviction in this country. Um, prohibitions on jobs that you can have, where you can live, who you can live with, and it's most dramatic for those folks. Um, and I haven't really had the the, the system is so segregated that, um, that individuals with, the, with that, I haven't, even, I, I haven't had the opportunity to get to know many of them because uh, they're kept in separate places. And, it's, and it's, just, it's another way that people are divided and conquered instead of coming together to, to have it. Right. And, and it's a tough thing because we, we do live in a punitive society, and, and that, that's maybe the toughest population to take up for, but I think it needs to be done. Yeah, my name's Mike, and I'm an ex-lifer. I'll be out three years in office. And what I found really horrifying about this whole, uh, you know, they talk about the monetization of the prison system. And what I call the people that are running that are uh, socially conformed they know that to keep this system in place, it, it, and that's 
their goal to keep it in place depends on thousands of new victims every year. So they're running that. That's why I call them psychopaths. Because they know that that system, to keep that system in place, depends on thousands of victims every year. And I find that horrifying. So if you want to talk about changing that system, bringing it down, you have to replace these psychopaths people that have a heart. Hmm. David. I'm struck by how much of the change that needs to come about in the system is going to have to come about as a result of political action on the right. Uh, I keep hearing uh, what, we can, what we need to do to change the system. And unfortunately, the ones who are most impacted by the ones that are the, the least power to change it. The problem will only reach fruition or uh, an apex of society that's already solved is when the, the non incarcerated society realizes that having huge chunks of their rural population disenfranchised, uh, shackled up, not able to find a job, etc., because of That's the only time it's going to change. When a whole town realizes that because its main ethnic group is tied into the prison system and they can't vote, then they realize they lost 25% of their vote and they don't get the mayor they want because half of them can't vote or, or don't know how or whatever. The idea that, that this change is only going to come about as a result of things about the prison system itself is, in my view, um, optimistic at best. Uh, I think because, the, as John Oliver called it, the, the fucking of the country, as it were, um, came about in, in combination with these long prison sentences, uh, disenfranchising the people who've been sentenced, these fines for everything, about your car, about whatever, that keep poor people constantly going in and out of jail. It, it, it's, I feel like, like the solution is broader and more political and, uh, and more social in nature, which is why I think this business of integrating people who have come out from a life sentence and being a, a, a part of our society the way we want to among our network of friends is the most activist thing we can do of all. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, I think um, that the, the forces that want to incarcerate will latch on to any story. Uh, so when somebody fails or falls or falters, uh, they're going to grasp onto that and say, see, uh, these folks are irredeemable. And likewise, I think empowering uh, returning citizens and allowing them to speak for those that are still inside is probably one of the most important things. Uh, yes? Sure. There's two examples that I can think of. Um, the only other two examples that uh, nation states have incarcerated people on this scale are Nazi Germany uh, with the concentration camps. And it was a dramatic shift when they lost the Second World War. And um, the Russian gulag system. And that's really it. That's, that's where the comparisons stop. Karen. Oh, go ahead. Not that I'm aware of. The, 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 they're really, I mean, I, I, I make those comparisons tongue in cheek because they're, really, uh, they're not really comparable. Those, those weren't, uh, those were unique situations yeah. where populations were being persecuted for totally different reasons. Uh, well, or maybe not. But um, not, there's, there's really been nothing in human history on this scale. Uh, this is like the industrialization of incarceration. And, it, and, it's, and it's done in sort of a sterile way. 
So there are no ovens. Uh, it's done behind closed doors. It's shrouded in secrecy. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for this opportunity, because I think it needs to, to have a light shown on it before there's any change. And I wish there was an easy answer. There's so many factors playing into it. And there's 3,111 counties and parishes in this country that are driving it, uh, because it's counties that send people to prison. And so it's so difficult to target the problem as a whole, because it's so diffuse. Karen. It could well be. I, I, that's the blind spot in, in the, the data that I've looked at. I haven't looked at gender comparisons, but I've read a lot of articles on the sexual abuse that women endure at the hands of guard, guards in, in prison systems. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's... Yeah, and that, it, that, and that is typically not a feature in men's prisons, but sexual assault is. Um, so. The federal government passed the Prison Rape Elimination Act a, a few years back to address that issue. So it's, and that's another thing that's probably playing into that recidivism rate because that there, you've got toxic masculinity and sexual assault, and the victims of that, how they process that, and how that manifests is anybody's guess. Yeah, really quick, I'm sure you that. I'll get you next. Huh, interesting. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. And the other thing about sexual predators and everything, I just want to say depression breeds obsession. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of that in this country, is depression. And a lot of fucked up people and a lot of screwed up things religion has done to people or where it comes from, I don't know. But I think it's important to realize there's a fine line between a lot of folks on the outside of the world and on the inside. You know, and anybody can be arrested. And I just want to thank you all for your, your, your input and your, um, for your input. A lot of hands are going up, so I'm going to, I'm going to just call on those that haven't spoken yet. Uh, you and then you and you, and then I'll circle back around to you. So you know, in San Francisco, we have a chance to do something in November because we have one of the few district attorney elections in the country. San Francisco is one of the few places where we get to vote for the district attorney. And this coming November is the first time we don't have an incumbent wow. running for district attorney. And I suggest there's four candidates, and I suggest that you really look into who the candidates are. I don't want to stand here and, and speak for my candidate, but only one of them has been a public defender. He grew up with his parents both incarcerated. So wow. he knows what it's like to go visit his parents in prison every day. His father is in prison for life. His mom finally got out. But I highly recommend that you look into the district attorney's 
election this November because we can do something the way we did in terms of that. And I, I think that's where it starts, is things like that. that the, these small elections in particular communities, it, it's such a diffuse problem that that's really, I think, uh, one of the best ways to address it. Thank you. And I'd like to get his name on you. Uh, this gentleman and then, yeah. So yeah, uh, Ruth, Ruth uh, Wilson Gilmore, she, she put out a book um, that, that looked at that very issue. And the argument that she presents is that, uh, that there was a, a surplus of labor, um, that with you know, the rise of automation, and, um, and that this was a, a, a way, maybe not intentionally, but, but address that. So you incarcerate a huge swath of unemployed and maybe undesirable folks, and then you also create these uh, prison guard jobs and all the ancillary jobs that go along with it. I, I don't think that that, um, it explains some, and, and I think that that phenomenon is real, but it, it's difficult to just pigeonhole this thing into one category. So I think that's definitely a component of it, and, uh, and, and speaks to how uh, tricky this, this problem is. Um, you know, and now that there's actually a, a no recession, no surplus of labor, it seems like the conversation has shifted, and so maybe that is playing a part in there as well. Um, it's, it's tough to say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we we need to really just focus on like two R words: rights and radicalism. Right. The word radicalism we think of as being extreme, but it actually comes from the Latin word uh, radix, which means roots. So when we go to the root of the problem, let's go to the root of the of America. Mm -hmm. So this country was founded on capitalism, racism. We didn't become a powerful country without a capitalist system that had racism embedded in it and still does that allowed us to become a superpower within years, right? That is, that's unheard of. So slavery was needed to make that happen. It is still needed today. If prisoners had the rights that was taken away, the Bill of Rights that prisoners had, which gave some accountability and transparency what was going on in prison, things wouldn't be so abusive in prison. In the parole system, parole officers can do whatever the hell they want to do without any type of re repercussion. I was put in jail for 24 hours the day before I was released from parole because he said he wanted to. What happens to him? Absolutely nothing because he's protected by law to do so. So when we go back to the beginning, when he just mentioned about the excess people, no jobs, whatever, industrial, well that happened even during slavery, you know what I'm saying? It, when slavery ended, prisons began. There was no prisons for black people doing slavery. There was no cops. There was no police department doing slavery. So when we look at the beginning and the roots of this, the police departments that make people feel safe, the privilege feel safe, and control the population that they want to be safe from. Both populations have to come together and say, look, we don't feel harmed by you being in here, and we don't have to attack you. Most people are attacked by their own kind. Whites attack whites, blacks attack what, uh, blacks, Mexicans attack Mexicans, or in general, and, 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 and so forth. Sexual assaults happen more in the home than it does outside the home. So when we're talking about laws and, and policing and all of these things, the radical approach is to go back to the root. 
get a, do away with the police departments. Guess what? The police department came about when the Democratic Party under the white slavery uh, reconstruction came about. The Ku Klux Klan was the first police department. Mm -hmm. So if we go back and, and eradicate that, what do we have? Exactly. We call it neighborhood watch, neighborhood policing, whatever you got. So the neighborhoods would be in charge of their criminals and our, their infractors. Who, who infracts, right? Who breaks the law? And then they would be able to stay in their community and give back, as we say, you know, give back, to, you know, uh, what we did wrong, pay back our, our community, instead of the money going to all these other things. So, at, again, at the same time, it's going back to what this country is founded on. So, yeah, I, you know, there's, there's so many uh, grassroots efforts to uh, address this. One of them, um, so there is a movement for prison abolition. Angela Davis has been pushing for that for many, many years. And I, and I won't sit here and tell you that she's wrong. Um, I, I don't know the approach to take. I, I'd say that I would support anybody who's doing anything to roll this back. And maybe one of us will hit on something. Uh, because so far, nothing seems to be working. Uh, Zarina and David. And uh, yeah, I totally agree. I'm going to have this one straight, straight up. Um, uh, and to go into two things, there's a really amazing book called The End of Policing, which is a really wonderful history on like, how the police got power in the, in the US. It really came about when like, uh, it was really like, abolished slavery, uh, and then suddenly people felt threatened by having all these free sort of black people around, and we went from having even watching it to having the police. Uh, and the other thing I want to say is, as an abolitionist, I'm really interested in the root causes. And I've been to a place in Spain where they have abolished the police. Uh, and they've done so by abolishing poverty. Uh, and, uh, and, and like that's really important about this stuff, right? We're criminalizing poverty, we're criminalizing trauma. And if we want to like actually abolish these things, I think we have to start with like social children. That's, yeah, yeah, great. Right. Okay, that's all the same thing. <laughs> David? Um, so, a couple things. Sadly, I think because of the mass incarceration of over 2 million ethnic Uyghurs and over a million Falun Gong religious practitioners, you're going to have to add China back to your list. Um, and China seems to be hell bent on becoming the one that incarcerates more actual individuals than any other country on earth. Not the percentage. We still own the percentage now. We're still doing that. That's what you saw. But uh, China, unfortunately, is uh, is is coming to the top of the list as far as numbers go, uh, and the ways that they're doing it illustrate, I think, the future problems that uh, will face incarcerates and returning incarcerates here in America. Because as soon as China perfects ethnically appropriate facial recognition software and their total coverage of society with their social credit system based on every individual decision you make, as soon as that happens, that's going to be exposed. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that this problem of privatization um, is more deeply seated than simply the privatization of the prisons. I think the only reason they really went with prisons was not because they particularly hated prisoners. It's that they wanted to privatize everything, social security, the transportation network, all the public schools. But because prisoners have no voice and prison, prisoners' families have no voice, that was the first thing to go because nobody was there to object. Every time they say, let's privatize Social Security, millions of seniors start writing letters and threatening to vote somebody out of office. But you say privatize the prisons, people are like, I don't know anybody in prison, if that's true. Or they say, well, we're powerless anyway, what can we do? Um, so there is something that's to be said for how much privatization is going on in society. It's worth noting that our Secretary of Education is the queen of private education. And her brother is the queen of private, is the king of private armies. He offered to buy the conflict in Afghanistan from, from the Trump administration. These people are now funneling these children who've been uh, incarcerated in the border into private uh, care for children who are incarcerated. And it's it's getting bigger and bigger. I think I think what we need, need to do is face the political nature of this problem. Because it's not going to happen just by the incarcerated and their families alone. I think it's it's going to take an entire community resisting the urge to pay rich people to run our lives for us. I think it's going to take something a lot more focused on getting rid of the, the demon of privatization. And that's all right. Yeah.
Yeah, so you, know, you mentioned like, you know, how uh, well, God you know, and the reason, you know, the American reason that I've used in my age, right? Like, you know, again, with all those levels of things. Like, I, like, how progression reasons are not controlled by cops. They're controlled, like, how progression reasons are controlled by humans themselves. So I want to ask, like, you know, is there is uh, any, like, movement to, like, organize and, like, you know, to take the control of the reasons, like, you know, from America? Prisoners rise up? Is that? No, 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 not rise up. You know, like, like half of Russian, half of uh, Russian prisoners are controlled by mates. Right. Well, like, like cops are there. Like, you know, they got them, so they will be inside. But no. there is no regime. Like, you know, there is like you don't wake up. Like, you know, like when they say, like, you, know, you run. Yeah, so, uh, I, you know, again, they're, they're, you know, I've never done time in Alabama or Rhode Island. Um, every state's a little bit different. California, it's incredibly regimented and incredibly structured and incredibly controlled. They've, they've modernized. Uh, and, and what I can say is that, just Pelican Bay, let's pick that one since a lot of people have heard of it. Um, that's a supermax prison built up in Crescent City back in, I think, 87. And it was rapidly emulated across the nation because it's maximum control. Inmates don't leave the cell unless they're in handcuffs. You've got to put your hands out through a little port and get cuffed up. So there's, um, there's just no room for any kind of really agency, at least within the control of the institution. There's still uh, people that, that exert control over prison gangs and, uh, and street. Right, but like, you know, there's always the details, right? I mean, like, you know, if, if, like, if there is organization inside of the prison, like, you know, for example, like, you know, inmates can like, you know, like, cut their veins off and shit like that, right? Like, you, know, you, you, you still can, can fight that. Like, there's prison gangs, uh, and, th and that's that's the extent of the organization that I've seen, and and they've actually done some some positive things. There was a hunger strike that actually helped eliminate the the use of solitary confinement for decades. They still use solitary confinement in this state, but um, they had people that were confined 23 hours a day for 20 years, and that's been rolled back. And that, that's about the extent of it, and it's typically a negative influence, but they've done some positive but things. But uh, why don't they like, 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 uh, organize like, I, I, like, I, I try to understand that why I, I don't understand. So, what, what, what's the question? No, no the games. Like, you know, like, the games, the own side, right? Like, you know, they're big organizations. Why wouldn't they like, you know, link up and like, you know, make, make this super organization? Like, well, and then and, and that's super organized because and also because they're pitted against one another by the institution itself and by the administration. So that would be conceivably possible, but there's active measures being taken against that to continually pit uh, prisoners against one another. So so that fail has thus far failed to happen. I won't say that it's impossible and it should maybe manifest at some point, but so far uh, they've succeeded at thwarting that. So we'll take. One more, and come on up here. Give me some company. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, I have a question. Um, so I heard a statistic actually from Marvin that St. Quentin got a lot more resources, but the sentences don't seem to go down. And um, kind of pulling out some of these conversations, there's these really egregious things happening, like solitary confinement. Um, I land more in the space of like prison abolition. Is where, where does reform, if at all, fall into this? And, and how do we approach reform in a way that doesn't just accuse us from making actual progress uh, in the actual like, elimination of this as a societal response to trauma and poverty? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think there's many answers to that question. One is, um, is second life and embracing uh, people that are returning and, and, and helping to empower them so they don't, so that they can break that cycle. Um, the, the systemic problems, the, the, the big problem is there's a huge segment that doesn't want change. There's prison guard unions that are vested in this system and are, and are very influential and incredibly savvy. And they're adaptable. Um, so, I wish I had an answer. That's one of the reasons why I'm speaking here today is, is I'm seeking solutions, but I think 
ultimately the shotgun approach. Try everything. Throw everything but the kitchen sink and hope something works. I don't. Well, so I think, I think there needs to be a coalition between those of us that have suffered under it and maybe are relatively powerless, but there are plenty of elites who, for lack of a better term, who are uh, uh, invested in changing. I mean, I, I'm not sure, I, I could be getting this wrong, but I think it was Kim Kardashian or somebody was recently advocating for somebody. So there's people with influence who are... Uh, interested, and I, but, I, but I think that there, there needs to be a coalition uh, of, of everyone that is interested because there is a tight coalition of those that are disinterested. There are victim rights advocate groups and there are prison guard unions and there's private prison industry and then there's those subsidiary industries that uh, you know some of the states they, they let out their medical services to, to private companies so they may own the prisons but they pay a private company to provide medical for, for uh, inmates, or the food. So there's, there's vested economic interests, prison guard unions, and many, many other interests that, that are uh, vested in maintaining the status quo. And so I think one possible solution is unity on the, on the opposite side of that. You know, because I think there's a lot of people with a lot of great ideas, and they need to work together. Yeah. Yes? Thank you so much. I tried to find